Hey, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Thinking Christian. I am excited today uh, to have Professor Piercy from Houston Christian University on with us today on the program. Um, she is not only a professor of apologetics at Houston Christian University, but a scholar in residence and the author of numerous books, including The Soul of Science, Told Truth, Finding Truth, Love Thy Body, and the one we're going to be talking about today, which is The Toxic War Against Masculinity. And so I'm really excited. This is sort of like uh, I'm going a little bit of fanboy. Um, I've been reading uh, Nancy Piercy's books for a really, really long time and uh, really just appreciate you being on the show. And uh, it's great for you to be here. So thanks for being here, Nancy. Well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate that. So let's dive in and talk a little bit about uh, the toxic war against masculinity. Um, what what was it that motivated you to write on this topic? What what brought it to your consciousness that this needed to be addressed? You know, it, it was largely the hostility that I saw against men, even in respected mainstream publications. Like the, the particular article that really triggered me was an article in the Washington Post, which, which was titled, Why Can't We Hate Men? And I thought, really? Huh. Uh, a Huffington Post editor tweeted, hashtag, kill all men. You can buy t-shirts that say, so many men, so little ammunition. And then there are even books that are coming out very bluntly titled, like, I hate men, and no good men, and the end of men. And to my surprise, by the way, there were also some male authors jumping on the bandwagon. So uh, there was a male author who wrote a book in which he said, talking about healthy masculinity is like talking about healthy cancer. And then the final one, which is actually not in the book, but you may have seen it because it was in the news. So the uh, director of the movie Avatar, uh, James Cameron, uh, sure. was quoted in the news saying, do you remember this? Testosterone is a toxin and you have to work it out of your system. Yeah. So when I saw that it had become so socially acceptable to attack men this way, I said, we've got to get to the bottom of this. You know, wh where's this coming from? Um, you can't really stand against a social trend unless you know where it came from and how it developed. And so that was my goal yeah. in this book is to kind of help people get a sense of where is this coming from and how can we stand against it more effectively? You know, I, it, and having read the book, I mean, I think I have a good sense of where um, you'd say it came from. And I think one of the most compelling parts of the book actually is the shift from what you call, a, I believe, a covenantal sort of uh, social relationship to a um, contractual or social contract theory sort of imagination. Could you talk through that just a little bit? Oh, yeah. I love to talk about this um, because I think it has affected a lot of Christians and they don't know it. You know, we use the language of covenant when we talk about marriage, for example. But we've been very much influenced by um, a secular culture that, that, that the technical term is social contract theory. Social contract theory was the idea that um, it, there, it was during the early modern era when social philosophers, political philosophers, were trying to find an alternative to Christianity as the basis for modern culture. These were guys who were, you know, out to, you know, get rid of Christianity and form a new basis. Well, you know, up until then, the basis of our social institutions was covenant, not just marriage, but obviously church and even the state. You know, God had... A, God had established the, the state and we obey God by obeying the state. So, uh, and, this, and it was God's principles of justice and fairness and right, you know, what's right versus what's wrong. Uh, that was the foundation for politics. And so it was a big job to see, can we kick God out of politics? And the early modern thinkers, uh, we're talking about Hobbes, Locke and Rousseau. And what they did yeah. is they said, let's just suppose that uh, society, human society, began not in the Garden of Eden, but in a state of nature. And in the state of nature, which was obviously a substitute for the Garden of Eden, uh, humans had no social relationships. There was no marriage, there was no state, there was no civil society. People are running around under the trees as autonomous, disconnected, uh, independent individuals. And then the state is formed when these individuals come together and form a contract, you know, an agreement. So there's nothing organically connecting people. 
Um, there's there's nothing, you know, there's it's all Thank choice. You. It's all choice. Here's how one uh, political philosopher puts it. Liberalism at the heart is a claim that we can have no obligations to which we have not consented. You know, so consent yeah. makes it every, everything. Now, on the one hand, that doesn't seem so bad in politics, consent of the governed, but the, the attitude of contract then permeated all of our social institutions so that uh, you know, marriage is now treated mostly as a contract. It, and a co what's the difference? You know, a covenant is where two people you know, unite their lives. A contract is what an exchange of goods and services, you know, and it lasts yeah. only as long as it's benefiting me. And so a lot of people do treat marriage like, well, as long as I'm happy, but if I'm not, I'm out. And even abortion, um, it, there's a, our, yeah. our abortion law is based on the notion that the, the mother is not organically connected to the child, <laughs> that she has a right to you know, consent or not consent. Right? It's social contract theory. And that's how our, yeah. our laws about abortion are, are labeled. Uh, that's how they're framed. So even something as intimate as, you know, you grow a baby inside of you, if you're a woman, yeah. um, that that is not considered an, an organic uh, relationship. In my book, Love Thy Body, I actually quote some li liberal uh, philosophers who say, um, you know, the, the, the fetus is an intruder. It's like my private, this is my private property. And the fetus is an intruder and I can drive him off if I want, even to the point of killing him. It's, it's a matter of self-defense. So that, that is, yeah. that's how deeply contractual thinking has permeating, has permeating uh, the, the American society. And I think even a lot of Christians kind of treat marriage that way as well. So it's, it's a big change. And um, it, so, yeah, in the, in the book, I show how, well, to bring it to the topic of masculinity, I show how that especially influenced concepts of masculinity because men were no longer thought to be just naturally organically um, having certain obligations to their wives and children instead it was well it's a contract so I have obligations if I choose and if I choose not to I'm out of here so it's a big part of why masculinity has become in some ways harmful or toxic in a sec in its secular version because men no longer feel that that covenantal relationship with their wives and children. So I have a, I have a couple of follow-ups to that. Um, number one, I, you know, I'm most familiar with like Emile Durkheim and after the French Re revolution, you know, where they're, they're sort of really separating the church out and making it, you know, trying to marginalize it as a, a moral authority within society. And he's advancing sociology and as a, as sort of a substitute religion, let's say, right. Um, and there's a reason that that is coming about. What was the reason for, um, you know, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau to, to make these shifts within American culture? Was there something that was pressing in? Was this related to industrial revolution kind of thing? Was this related to, like, what needed to change that it made sense to move from, you know, covenantal social contract theory? Well, um, two answers. One is uh, okay. the, the person who has done the best work on this, I think, is a French political philosopher named Pierre Manon. And he, very open, by the way, he's a former Marxist who converted to Catholicism. And so when he writes this book, he says, well, they were really trying to get rid of the church <laughs> um, because the church was the primary society by that time, right? Um, the yeah. church had pretty much overcome ethnic divisions and racial divisions, um, national divisions. Remember, Paul, there, there's no Jew or Greek. There's no right. male or female. There's no slave or free. But it took a long time for that to actually change society. And what happened is the church then became the overarching um, so, social institution that gave a, a community, might be a better word. The church, in a sense, sure. replaced all of these other loyalties, all these other commitments, you know, we were Christians first, you know, um, yeah. the, uh, there was, there was um, in France, there was in the early church, there was a young man who was being persecuted for his faith. And they kept asking him, well, who are you? What's your name? Where are you from? And he just said, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. It's a really fun story of where all of his other identities were totally overwhelmed by the fact that I'm a Christian and that's first. 
And so to overcome that, secular thinkers had to say, let's see if we can uh, get rid of the impact of the church. We don't want that to be people's primary community anymore if you know if they were not Christian. So Pierre Manon says that was their primary motivation. I like the fact though that you've also brought in the material conditions of the Industrial Revolution because ideas don't really take you know they don't really permeate until you know society changes. And the Industrial Revolution had a huge impact on concepts of masculinity. Uh, yeah. Most of us think the concept of toxic, toxic masculinity came from like the 1960s, right? uh, second wave feminism. Yeah. But actually, you see it starting already in the 19th century. So before the Industrial Revolution, men worked alongside their wives and children all day right? on the family farm, the family industry, the family business. And so concepts of masculinity, ideals of what it meant to be a man focused much more on their caretaking role, on their responsibility for their family. Authority was defined even in terms of responsibility for the common good. It didn't mean you get to do whatever you want. You know, it meant you responsible for your family. Um, and it's fun when you can read even secular historians say things like, uh, masculine virtue was defined as duty to God and man. Um, yeah. So the question is, where did we lose that? And you're right, the Industrial Revolution was a key, a key changer. Um, it took work out of the home. And of course, men had to follow their work out of the home into offices and factories. And for the first time in American history, they were not working alongside people they loved and had a moral bond with, you know, their wives and children. Instead, they were working as individuals in competition with other men. And this yeah. did have a change on their character. Uh, and this is where you see the literature start, start to change. People started to complain. They started to protest that men were becoming egocentric, self-centered, aggressive, greedy, acquisitive. I'm using the language of the day. Um, yeah. and, and I was surprised how many people said they were making their work into an idol. In the 19th century, mm -hmm. you find a lot of people saying men are starting to make career success. You know, a financial achievement has become more important than, than caring for my family. So that was the beginning of uh, the, the change in the language describing men's. It was the first time ever that men's character was described in negative terms. And so, of course, we, if we want to figure out how to solve that problem, we have to go back and say, OK, it was when men got disconnected from their family. Uh, that suggests yeah. the solution has to do with reconnecting men with their family, even in an industrial age. Are there ways that we can still do that? And so what strikes me in all of that, and you make a comment at one point that, um, you know, people's perception of Jesus and his followers and the ideals of masculinity that they exhibit really aren't the sort of masculine characteristics that we normally see in men. You know, it's about harmony and fellowship and community as opposed to um, aggressiveness and competition, and, you know, violent acts or what have you. And so, you know, now we've sort of lost this, what is masculinity? We've got almost a false sense of what masculinity actually is. Is that what people end up identifying as sort of quote unquote toxic? Yeah, well, um, I would say it's it's the secular definition of masculinity that has become toxic. Um, let me give you a study. I start the book with this study because I found I found that this book is more controversial than any book I've ever written. Um, <laughs> I was not expecting that um, um, because my earlier book, Love Thy Body, was on questions of abortion, homosexuality, transgenderism. Right. It, it, I mean, people are like. People are saying that book is more relevant now than when you wrote it. Um, but but actually in the Christian world, this one has been more controversial. Uh, when I write a book, I always do a lot of reading groups because I want to rub off the rough edges. And okay. in my reading groups, uh, and I also teach in my, in my classes, so I get lots of feedback. That's, that's my goal. And when they told their friends and family that they were working through a manuscript on masculinity, invariably the first question was whose side is she on 
like what <laughs> you have to have a side yeah so men tended to <laughs> men tended to assume that if a woman was writing a book on masculinity that i was a male bashing feminist and more okay. progressive types tended to assume that i was some um, reactionary culture warrior you know defending men um and so i did put this study right at the beginning of the book because it tended to overcome mm -hmm. that initial suspicion <laughs> Um, so yeah. it was done by a sociologist named Michael Kimmel, and he is invited to speak all around the world. And so he came up with a very clever experiment. He would ask young men two questions. First, he would say, what does it mean to be a good man? If you're at a funeral and in the eulogy, somebody says he was a good man. What does that mean? And this sociologist said young men all around the globe had no trouble answering that they would immediately start listing things like duty, honor, integrity, sacrifice, do the right thing, be a protector, be a provider. Oh, and look out for the little guy. I kind of like that one. Um, be responsible. <laughs> and he would ask them, where did you learn that? And they would say, I don't know. It's just in the air we breathe. Or if they were in a Western country, they would often say it's part of our Judeo-Christian heritage. But then he would follow up with a second question. He would say, what does it mean if I say to you, uh, man up, be a real man? And the young men said, oh, no, no, that's completely different. They said, that means be tough, be strong, never show weakness, win at all costs, um, suck it up, play through pain, yeah. um, be competitive, get rich, get laid. And then, again, I'm, I'm using their language. Yeah. Um, and so this, the sociologist concluded that there actually are two competing scripts that young men feel today. On the one hand, universally, they recognize what it means to be a good man. Uh, and this is very encouraging. I mean, I, I was very heartened yeah. to read this. Now, even in non-Christian cultures, you know, apparently it's, it's intrinsic, it's innate. It's because men are made in the image of God that they do yeah. know what it means to be a good man. Uh, and, and another, by the way, another social, another study, this one by an anthropologist, found something very similar. It was the first ever cross-cultural study of concepts of masculinity. And he said that despite the differences in cultures, all cultures share a common code for manhood, that the good man will provide, protect, and procreate. He calls it the three Ps, provide, protect, and procreate, <laughs> meaning become a father, you know, build yeah. into the next generation. And so both of these were global studies showing that men do know that their unique masculine strengths, because they do have unique strengths, uh, were given them not to get what they want, but to provide, protect, care for those that they love and are responsible for. But on the other hand, of course, there are, there's this competing script, what, what the young yeah. men responded to as the, the real man, which... If, if it's separated, if it's detached from a moral vision, can become entitlement, dominance, control, you know, the things that we tend to yeah. consider more toxic. The Andrew Tate phenomenon, right? Fast cars, fast money, fast <laughs> yeah. girls. Um, yeah, yeah. That has become kind of the secular script of the, the quote unquote real man. And so... On the one hand, um, this gives us a much better way to approach these issues, right? Most men don't respond well yeah. to being called toxic. <laughs> Nobody would. Uh, so right. it's much better to, to try to support them, encourage them, affirm them in what they intrinsically and innately know is the good man. And on the other hand, yeah. uh, we need to sort of trace the roots of the real man and help people to see through it. Um, and, and a lot of my book is taken up with, you know, where did the real man come from? How did our society yeah. become so secularized that it's led to Andrew Tate? A Andrew Tate, I'll, I'll just give you one more anecdote. This was a yeah. former graduate student of mine who now teaches at a Christian school. And she recently emailed me and said, all my, all my male students are into Andrew Tate. She teaches high school. All my male students are fans of, of Andrew Tate. You know, they're even using his quotes in the yearbook. <laughs> and and uh, I said, well, where do you teach? At a classical Christian school. So even young Christian men are wow. reaching out to these online influencers. Uh, we have to help them to, 
be able to think critically about where the secular script for the quote unquote real man comes from so that, so that they have a critical grid in place and can figure out what's biblical and what's not biblical. Well, let me let me stop us there for a minute. We're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, I want to dive into that issue. That's really sort of amazing to me that that any Christian, even a young Christian man would gravitate toward Andrew Tate. Um, and so I'd kind of like to dig into that a little bit more. But let me take a break. And when we come back, we'll, we'll kind of dig into that a little bit more. OK, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are here. We're going to continue the uh, conversation with Professor Piercy. And uh, before we went to break, you had mentioned this influence of Andrew Tate. And I've kind of watched Andrew Tate uh, from afar. I've watched some of his YouTube stuff and those kind of things. Um, I would say, especially after reading your book, um, I didn't know too, too much about him. I think I probably, you know, just moved past him because I didn't get the attraction. What is it that you think? I, I mean, I guess to me, when I when I hear you talk about, you know, true masculinity and you have these things like integrity and honor and, you know, duty and caring for the little guy, for whatever reason, I gravitate more toward those than I do to things like aggressiveness, competitiveness, um, you know, vulgarity, <laughs> for lack of a better term, um, promiscuity, maybe you know, all those things. And uh, like, I realize I've got a unique background, you know, coming out of theological studies. And so maybe that has a bigger influence, but I'm just wondering why do you think that part of it, the bad side um, is so much more compelling than the good side or how are they confused? Um, by the way, um, to bring you up to date, I didn't, by the way, I didn't get entertained into my book either. And I, in, in hindsight, I wish I'd been right. more on, you know, on top of these trends. Uh, but now uh, there's a new there's a new one who has been hailed in uh, the New York Post as the new Andrew Tate. His name is Myron Gaines, and his tagline is, "I help men transform from simp's into pimps." Um, and he argues specifically that the relationship between men and women has always been transactional. And here's a direct quote from his book, all men are Johns, all women are whores. The, and, and he's being hailed as you know the next Andrew Tate. So where does this come from? I think it comes as a reaction to the fact that men and boys are falling behind and have been for quite a while. You know, boys are falling behind at all levels of education. Starts in kindergarten. You know, they don't have the same yeah. fine motor control that a girl has. And so they can't handle the scissors as well. So they already feel like they're falling behind. Um, and all the way up through high school, you know, girls are doing better in, in grades in terms of um, homework and grades and in terms of extracurricular activities and so on. And then college. College is now... Uh, on average, are sixty percent female in their students, forty percent male. More women than men go to graduate school and even professional schools like law and medicine. And so there have been a host of books that have come out on why boys are falling behind, for, with titles like "Why Why Boys Fail," "The Trouble with Boys," "The War Against Boys." So people have been noticing this. Um, and then when those boys grow up, they're falling behind too. Men are doing worse than they were in the past and worse relative to women. Men are much yeah. more likely than women to be homeless, to be drug addicted, drug or alcohol addicted, to be to have mental illness, uh, to commit crime. 90% or more of prison inmates are, are male. And, and unemployment um, is not showing up in the unemployment statistics because they've stopped looking for work. And so researchers yeah. had to dig a little deeper and they now tell us that male unemployment uh, during the key uh, earning er uh, ages is at Great Depression era levels. Great Depression wow. era. I mean, that was shocking when I read that because we, re we remember what a, <laughs> you know, what a tragedy that was. And then yeah. life expectancy has gone down. You know, women's has stayed the same, but men's has gone down so that uh, a magazine called The New Scientist had an article in which it said the major demographic factor now for early death is being male. And so, and even in Christian circles, so, you know, I teach at Houston Christian Uni University. And when I told my class, I was writing a book on masculinity. 
a male student shot back, what masculinity? It's been beaten out of us. 46% of American men uh, in, one, in one study agreed that these days society seems to punish men just for acting like men. And so on the one hand, what you're seeing is men falling behind and doing worse, dropping out of school, you know, the, this sort of failure to launch syndrome that we've all heard about, you know, young men sitting in their mom's basement playing video games. Yeah. But a reaction to that is the Andrew Tate, you know, boys don't, boys are not happy doing that. And so when they see an Andrew Tate saying to them, you know, man up, get a job, work out, get buff, get women, you know, that's part of it for him, right? He's got, he's had, he's, yeah. was it oh, seven? Yeah. I think he's had children with seven different women. Um, and Myron Gaines too, Myron, the, the new Andrew Tate specifically says, it's men are naturally promiscuous. And so even if he has a main woman, he shouldn't really marry her, but even if he has a main woman, that woman has to understand that he's going to have a lot of other women on the side because that's just the male nature. And of course, women cannot have other men on the side, but men can because that's their nature. So when when that's tied up with the message of empowerment as well, you know, get out there, make money, um, get yourself in shape, that becomes very attractive yeah. to boys who've been falling behind. Uh, unfortunately, um, th that's why the, the church really has to think through this issue. And how do we present, you know, a balanced biblical view of masculinity that's, you know, both tough and tender, you know, that's courageous and caring, you know, that covers the whole image of God. How do we support young men in developing that kind of a positive view of masculinity? Yeah, it's interesting. So, yeah, after I read through your book, I did. I just went out and did an internet search, and the the guys that I kept coming across, right, when I searched for like masculinity or you know what it means to be a man, those kind of things, I came across Andrew Tate an awful lot, right. Although um, he did seem a little more fringe than, let's say, the other one that kept popping up for me, which was Jordan Peterson. Now, Jordan Peterson obviously mm -hmm. has, a, I think, a more um, constructive message, right? One that's related at least to responsibility and, uh, you know, I would say more traditionally oriented values. But I didn't find anything um, that was frequently coming up masculinity from a Christian perspective, masculinity in the church, other than, you know, what I would consider to be sort of the bravado sort of folks that are sort of almost like saying man up within the church. Are you aware of any sort of good, strong Christian, like, where do we go for this? You know what I mean? Like when we're looking at this as a church and we're saying we need to address this, we need to fix this. There's, there's part of it that's understanding the issue. And I think your book helps to do that really, really well. And then there's this whole other side of it that says, you know, we, we've been blaming the church for feminizing things, which I'm not really sure I understand fully. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know that I've ever been to a feminine church. Um, but, uh, you know, like, what does the church do here? What? Because it feels to me like a really tricky spot to be in. Even after you understand the issue, how do we help men in the church to develop that self-confidence maybe? Um, the uh, that tough and tender that you're talking about, what does that even look like outside of just, you know, sort of basic discipleship? Yeah, yeah. well, actually, you're right, basic discipleship. But um, <laughs> yeah. there are there are some there are some, there are some, there are some, there are some decent um, sort of devotional books for men out there. Uh, you, okay. you might want to tap into uh, Church for Men. There's a website called Church for Men. And okay. um, it's written it's it's written by um, a man who wrote a book with a title, "Why Men Hate Going to Church." <laughs> so it's it's very good. It's 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 not a very it, it it doesn't dig deeply into history or anything like that. But it does give sort of yeah. um, ways in which the church can signal that they're pro masculinity. And okay. I, I actually like the I like the site very much. I like his book, um, Why Men Hate Going to Church. Um, but 
so that's a very practical thing. Yeah. But on the uh, on the level of on the level of teaching, one of the most interesting sources I found was a non Christian historian who talked about how a culture's view of God determines its view of masculinity. And this might help us think it through. For example, he says that polytheistic cultures, um, like you know the Norse gods and the Greek gods, sure. they, they tend to, well, the, the gods are constantly fighting. <laughs> they're, they're constantly right. warring. And so they, they exalt the warrior virtues. Um, uh, so to be a man is to be a warrior. And, and there's some truth to that. And then this historian goes on to monotheistic religions. And some forms of monotheism, God is so transcendent that he has no relationship with people. And he gives the right. example of Islam. And I quote, yeah. I quote a book on Islam that literally says, Allah would not condescend to have a love relationship with mere mortals. The very idea is repugnant. So that's the view of God in Islam. And so that leads to a view of man, uh, uh, masculinity as you know, power and authority. And then he moves to Judaism and says, well, that's monotheistic, but God does have a relationship with people, right? Yeah. And Jeremiah, God says, you know, I will give them a heart to know me. So God has a covenant relationship with his people. And so in Judaism, to be a man is to be a loving father. You still have the authority, but it's the love and relationship. And then it was so funny reading this secular historian because he says and then jesus comes along <laughs> and he complexifies everything because <laughs> jesus has all of the <laughs> jesus has all of the good parts you know of these other religions but he introduces something new S uh, servant leadership you know the son of man mm -hmm. came not to be served but to serve sure. and this secular historian says no other religion has that no other religion has a God who comes to serve his people. Um, and so he says, you know, as a result, Christianity actually holds up virtues for men, like love and compassion and tenderness that are more commonly assigned to women. These yeah. are now masculine virtues. And so he ends by saying Christianity has a much more balanced view of masculinity than any other religion or culture because yes you can have you know the 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 traits that are more commonly assigned to women as well as the traits that are more commonly assigned to men like you know toughness and strength and courage and so on and so i love that i would like to see yeah. christians recover that balance and and you know it takes i think it's funny that it kind of it takes an outsider to tell us what's so unique about <laughs> christianity but um it, it 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 is it, Christianity is unique, and we should be, you know, bold in bringing that into the public square. Yeah, that's good. Let me uh, let's take one more break, and then I think when we come back, because I I really appreciated some of the more constructive ideas you had, particularly in relation to men and work. Um, I know I know I heard you talk about this on the Sip Toss podcast um, as well. And so um, I kind of like to dig into that a little bit and just talk about the possibilities kind of post COVID and uh, moving into remote work um, that maybe men have to recover something that was lost uh, during the industrial revolution. So let's take a quick break and then we'll come back. All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, we are here kind of last segment with uh, Professor Piercy and uh, Nancy. It, and I can't remember whether it was just on the podcast or was also in the book. So forgive me for that. Um, but at, at some point you talked about um, sort of the move toward remote work and the way that that has the potential, at least, to reconnect fathers to their home or men to their home. Am I getting that about right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I quote a psychiatrist, Frank Pittman, who says, we're not going to have a better class of men until we have a better class of fathers. And I think that's right. When we talk about what's the solution here, the solution is fathers getting reconnected to the kids. And, you know, the, the one of the barriers, of course, is that fatherhood is mocked and ridiculed today in the media, right? The Homer Simpson paradigm that, you know, the, the father is always the bumbling idiot. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever read the Berenstein Bears, but one of oh, my yeah. sons loved the Berenstein Bears. And, and the father's always the one who's, who's, 
you know, who's more childish than the children. Um, and so where did that come from? I mean, we know that's a problem, but where did it come from? And again, it comes from the Industrial Revolution because it, it, when it took fathers out of the home, this was a huge shock. You know, we're used to it now. We don't realize it was a huge yeah. shock to suddenly have fathers not there, especially for their sons. And people began to complain that boys were growing up without that masculine presence in their life, without father's supervision. They were becoming wild. The leading psychologist of the 19th century said, never before has the American boy been so wild and so half orphaned. I love that phrase. You know, half orphaned because the father's not there raising him. Um, he's being left to female guidance, the psychologist put it, female guidance in home and school and church. Um, and so... So the question is, can we, even in an industrial age, overcome that gap between work and home? And I think the pandemic was a game changer. It did show a lot of people that it was more possible than they ever thought was than they ever thought before. Um, yeah. Harvard, Harvard University did a study. This is recent, so it's not in the book. Um, but Harvard just did a study where 68% of fathers said that they did not want to go back to the workplace full time. They would prefer wow. some kind of hybrid situation where they could be yeah. better integrated, you know, into their family. And, um, but we also have to, um, we have to convince the CEOs too. So I made sure I found quotes from CEOs saying things like, you know, we, we were hesitant to try re remote work in the past because, well, of course, we thought people would slough off, right? Productivity right. would go down. And they said, we didn't see that. During the pandemic, when everyone went home, we saw no drop in productivity. In fact, in some ways, they saw more productivity because people were not wasting time commuting, you know, um, yeah. and unnecessary meetings. Uh, so they actually said, they actually said, you know, sometimes we have to tell them to stop, stop working. Um, but yeah, so I have lots of anecdotes because, you know, it's, it's, it's on the anecdotal level still. Um, there yeah. haven't been that many studies, but uh, I, I gave lots of stories about pe people I knew or read about who had come home during the pandemic. And, you know, let me tell you one, because this is uh, one of my graduate students is married to an yeah. IT professional. And during the pandemic, he came home, worked from home, and because he was home, he was able to be more involved with the family's homeschooling. He decided he would be the one to make lunch for the family every day. He was available to take kids to soccer practice and choir practice. He picked up so much of the family uh, responsibilities that his wife was able to start a part-time job. Um, and the whole yeah. family benefited from the added income. So I interviewed him for the book and he said, our life is so much more balanced now. I am never going back to a cubicle for 40 hours a week. And then the final kicker, he said, is the time that he used to spend in the morning commuting to work. He said, I now spend praying every morning with my wife. No. So it's right at this yeah. point, it's, it's stories like that that can inspire people to say, actually, let's see if there's a way that we can bring men home, reproduce to some degree, you know, the pre-industrial pattern where fathers were just as involved as mothers with their children. And, and of course, you know, boys benefit, I think, the most. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not a question anymore that fatherless boys do worse. Right. <laughs> that right. Kids who are just, boys in particular, who are disconnected from their fathers are much more likely to have problems in school and addictions and crime and so on. Um, and, and so getting fathers more involved and that you'll, you'll like this. Um, there was a study done on how families succeed in passing along their religious convictions. It was a 35 yeah. year longitudinal study. So well done that it won a bunch of awards and it found two surprising results. Number one, fathers matter more than mothers in passing along the family's huh. religious heritage. And mothers matter, of course. Yeah. Um, but fathers matter more. My, my female yeah. students don't like this. They say, oh, that's not fair. I say, I'm sorry, it's just a fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> you know, if the mother, if the mother is, is a church going, you know, committed Christian, she has some influence. But if the father's 
a committed church going Christian, it has greater influence on the children. But the second thing they found was it only works if he has a close, warm, loving, affectionate relationship with his children. In other words, he can be a moral exemplar. He can be a pillar of the church. He can have perfect theology. But if the children perceive him as distant and cold, they don't follow him. Yeah. They, they will not follow him in the, in, in the faith. So yeah. it's fascinating. It's the quality of the relationship. And even secular uh, researchers are finding the same thing. There was a whole book on how, how to raise masculine boys. And it was, it was based on research. And uh, the study showed that for raising a masculine boy, a boy with a, you know, a secure sense of his own masculinity did not depend yeah. on how masculine the father was. Didn't matter whether he was, you know, the rough and tough yeah. outdoorsy guy or the or the quiet scholar <laughs> that didn't matter what mattered is if he had a warm loving close relationship with his son then he would be yeah. you know that gave the son a strong sense of masculinity so the secular scientists are finding the same thing as the christian ones are yeah. that the father's relationship with the son is what matters the most in raising boys with a healthy positive view of masculinity well i will say i when i switched jobs in 2018 i started working from home and i found pretty much just anecdotally i have found everything you just said in my life over the last five years six years now um it you know it it kept me from working all the time i was available to do things with my kids uh, my son had just turned 13 right around that time when I switched jobs. And so I've been, you know, available to him all through his teenage years. And, um, you know, my daughters are 14 right now. Um, and so I drive them places. I cook lunch. I do dinner, you know, like all those kind of things around the house. Um, and it's not so much that uh, I feel like I'm, you know, kicking in, you know, on that contractual basis, like I'm doing more more of my share now or whatever. It's actually that I enjoy just being with my family and having these opportunities to build into them and to provide for them and to contribute to them. Um, and so I think there's something to this remote work thing, um, revised schedule thing um, that we really ought to take into account um, as not only as a church, but just as a nation. Um, figuring this out would be, I think, extraordinary. Um, it's been amazing for me. Uh, I did have one more question before we kind of close everything out. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been most concerned with as I look out on the landscape of what's going on in our nation right now, what's going on in the world really is technology. <laughs> and so it just feels like to me, um, technology is giving us way more excuses to be less responsible that it, it tends to have this almost dual action on us where we're no longer, you know, some of the things you were saying about um, the boys being influenced by women in the church and women in the community, that was the perception back when, you know, the industrial age began. Now it feels to me like our boys are being influenced by men that I would prefer they not be influenced by, like an Andrew Tate or, you know, whomever. And these people are accessible through, easily accessible through technology. You know, we're starting to see these other influences come in and really maybe shape um, what our kids are thinking, how our kids are thinking, um, and really also giving them opportunities to not work. And so those layers of responsibility and duty and integrity just seem to me like we're starting to erode them as we strip ourselves of the sort of effort that would actually produce character. I'm wondering, you know, having written your book and looked at these perceptions, did you think at all about, you know, you had the industrial revolution, which was obviously technical. Do you see that playing a role today still? And, and if so, how? Yeah, I mean, it could, there could be good things. In other words, one of the reasons yeah. we can do remote work is because of technology. Because of, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I have, That's a I mean, good I'm thing. talking to you. 100%. Yeah. I don't, I don't have to fly to where you are to have this interview. <laughs> um, no, no. Yeah. So, yeah. And 100%, I, really I should have phrased think... it 
probably a little more balanced, but <laughs> yeah, uh, the there's the positive side and the negative side. And so, yeah, I'm just wondering what your thoughts on are on all of it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Well, because I have I have actually written articles in the past on how, you know, we should take advantage of this technology to kind of bring work back home. And so I, yeah. I want to make sure we keep that in mind as well. But um, I do quote um, a psychologist. He's, he's very well known. Um, uh, Gabor Mate has written a book called um, Hold On To Your Kids. <laughs> Hold On To Your Kids. Uh, the subtitle is something like why parents need to matter more than peers. And he okay. makes a very strong case in that book that we're losing our kids to, to the um, smartphones and, and other technologies. And okay. you see, we didn't, we used to lose our kids in the sense, you know, in other words, kids would be exposed to non-Christian ideas and often be, you know, att attracted um, and lose their faith. Uh, because of school, or actually, when I was young, it didn't. It often happened when you went off to college. Right now, it's happening much sure. earlier. But when you went, it, it's it's still a crisis for some people though when they go to college and they're really immersed for the first time in non-Christian ideas. But it's starting to happen much more in high school, and now because of social media, it's happening even younger. And the point of his book, um, Gabor Mate, um, hold on to your kids, is that. Kids are being alienated from their parents while they're still living at home. And that's the yeah. tragedy. He says the kids are on their phones 24 mm. seven. They sleep with their phones. They wake up in the night and text their friends. Um, he says they are beginning to form their primary attachment to their peers instead of their parents. Right. You know, the primary yeah. um, theory in psychology today is called attachment theory. And it's the idea that yeah. to have a healthy, you know, to be healthy psychologically, you have to, from the time you're an infant, you have to have a strong, firm attachment to your major caregiver, usually your mom and dad. <laughs> um, and so, you know, they're really investigating the importance of attachment. And so what he writes is kids are starting to get their primary attachment to their peers. And this is very dangerous for a couple of reasons. One is peers are never going to give the unconditional love <laughs> that the parents will, you know, yeah. and therefore these kids will always be insecure. And secondly, they're not mature enough. Peers are not mature enough to have the wisdom that parents have. And so they're getting bad advice and bad ideas from mm -hmm. their, from their peers. And so he's written a whole book addressed to parents saying you, you need to put a limit on screen time. Um, yeah. And, and, and by the way, that does remind me that one of the things we didn't manage to cover is uh, that Christian fathers do much better, according to the studies, Christian fathers, yeah. uh, evangelical men who attend church, uh, have better marriages, their wives report higher levels of happiness, and they, ha they spend more time with their children, 3.5 hours more per week than secular fathers. And, and that's both in shared activities and also in discipline. And one of the things that they tested was putting limits on screen time. And so Christian fathers are more likely to put those limits on than other fathers. Um, and so that's a good thing. And by the way, uh, those studies are studies we should be bringing into the church more too. I had to go digging in the academic literature to find out that Christian men are doing so well, you know, both yeah. as, as husbands and fathers. It, they test out as the most yeah. loving husbands and fathers of any other major group in America. And yeah. uh, Christians don't know that. <laughs> and so that was a big no. part of the book too, was giving this positive data that we can use to encourage and support Christian men who are doing a good job in terms of their marriage and uh, and their families. Well, I will say one of the things that I, I think was a corollary to that research that you just brought up was that nominal Christian fathers actually exhibit more of the stereotypes of toxic, you know, toxic masculinity or that sort of man up sort of masculinity than, you know, evangelical Christians, we might say. So unless there's that deeply rooted discipled commitment to being a Christian, you're still seeing much of the, you know, what is exhibited in the world exhibited by nominal Christians. Am I, am I getting that right? Yeah, it was so clarifying. Um, because the first pushback I always get is, but haven't we all heard that Christians divorce at the same rate as the rest of the world? 
And so yeah. the researchers went back to the data and they made that crucial distinction that you just made between committed church going Christian men who test out as the most loving and engaged fathers versus nominal Christians. And these would be men, my students don't even know what nominal means. So I have to tell them <laughs> N O M is Latin for name. So it means in name only. So on a survey yeah. like this, they might check the Baptist box, for example, but they rarely, if ever, actually attend church. And you're right. These men test out shockingly different. They fit all of the toxic stereotypes. Their wives report the lowest level of happiness. They spend the least amount of time with their kids. They are more likely to divorce, even 20% higher than secular couples. And they have yeah. the highest rate of domestic violence of any group in America. And so this is what the church is up against, right? We have, on the one hand, we have men who test out as much better than secular men. And we have these nominal Christians sort of at the fringes of the Christian world who test out as worse than secular men, you know, and how can we have, how can churches have a ministry on the one hand, supporting the men who are doing well. And on the other hand, can we figure out a better discipleship program for these guys who are <laughs> identifying as evangelical? Uh, yeah. But they're responsible for a lot of the negative stereotypes out there, right? You know, people who have negative yeah. stereotypes of, of, Christians. Um, I, I found several that I put in the book, um, but I'll give you just one. This was the co-founder of the Church Two movement, which followed the Me Too movement. Yeah. And she said, the theology of male headship feeds the rape culture that we see permeating American Christianity today. And uh, Where do those negative stereotypes come from? Primarily from the nominals. <laughs> Nominal, nominal Christians. Christian men. And so it's really yeah. important that we figure out how to disciple them, bring them in from the fringes. You know, they're taking words like headship and submission, but they're infusing them with secular meanings from, like you yeah. said, the quote unquote real man. And, and so, you know, they, they give off the impression that, oh, well, I'm doing this because I'm a Christian and, you know, <laughs> I'm the head of the home, but they're putting meanings into that from the secular world. And so, they need right. to be better discipled and what what the bible really says about things like headship in the home well and i think what was really encouraging about that line of research just to turn the frown upside down is that the people who are attending church are actually doing better <laughs> like the committed christians are actually doing better and so that should be an encouragement for the church that they're getting something right <laughs> you know and that that if people would really engage and be involved and commit, that this is life-changing stuff, it's really transformative. But if you want to stay on the fringes and kind of do your own thing and meet God on His turn on your terms, it's not going to work out as well. And so, um, yeah, it's really fascinating stuff. I so appreciate you doing that research because when I was reading through that, I was like, wow, what a powerful distinction between, you know, committed Christians and nominal Christians that you never see in the meet. You know, like you never hear that, you never see it. It's uh, it's kind of buried underneath the big, broad statistics. And so I so appreciated you drawing that out. Yeah, that's right. If you well, if you just look at evangelicals as a whole, the numbers are going to be skewed. They're going to be misleading. And so I, yeah. I was like I said, I had to dig in the academic literature to find this. We need to get it out in the churches. That, that was another <laughs> reason. Uh, two reasons I wrote the book. You know, we started the interview with because this yeah. society has become so hostile to masculinity. But then the second reason is because, hey, we have a solution, you know, and it's yeah. not just, you know, a pep talk from a religious leader. You know, th this is solid empirical research. This is evidence-based findings that Christianity yeah. does, in fact, uh, to use the subtitle of my, my book, it does, in fact, reconcile the sexes. Yeah. Well, I want to give you the final word. Anything you want to leave with the audience um, other than, hey, buy, toxic, buy the toxic war on masculinity. I'll say that. But anything else that you want to uh, and leave with the audience before we uh, say goodbye here? Well, I would like to invite you to come to my website. My uh, publisher very graciously updated it so it's colorful and fun. So you can come and browse my other books that way, nancypiercy.com. And, and you can even leave a comment I don't get time to answer them all, but I do read them all. So come on, come on over and say hello, nancypiercy.com. And we'll make sure that we link that in the show notes. Uh, Nancy, I really appreciate you being here. This has been great. I'm very thankful for your work. And 
Toxic War Against Masculinity and your other books. Um, I've read two of them, uh, Total Truth and Finding Truth. And so um, in addition to the Toxic War Against Masculinity. So I'm looking forward to picking a couple others up and uh, I'll be visiting your website as well. So thanks for being here. Really appreciate the time. And uh, to all of you who are listening, uh, come on back to the next episode of Thinking Christian. Take care, everybody.